this uh, presentation is going to be a little different than some of the other presentations today. You can consider this uh, op-ed opinion. These opinions don't represent those of my employer, just to be clear, the logo's on there, but these are my personal opinions. And these are opinions that I've sort of come to over the last uh, 12 or so years in the space. So take them as you will. And one of the things I will point out as I give my, my personal opinion, if you disagree with it, tell me. Let's, let's discuss this, because it's one of those areas that's, I think, constantly changing. And the, the very debate on the subject matter is probably the most exciting part of the industry itself. So uh, just a little background on how and why I came to this particular subject. Back in January, I think it was, I wrote a blog post on Information Week that basically said this, you know, PaaS versus you know, infrastructure as a service, IaaS, does it matter? It, it, are, the, are the two converging or are they diverging? That's the basic question that I was asking in this post. So th this presentation is kind of a continuation on that theme. And I, and, and I have an opinion, and I know a lot of people also have opinions on this. So what I'm going to do is kind of go through the whole thought process and maybe see what, what we think as a, as a community and where we can go with those ideas. But first, you'll notice I love graphics. I love pretty graphics about me. I've got one of those job titles that are totally meaningless. Like, Chief Technology Advocate, what the hell is that, right? But it's funny, I, I, when I started the company, I, I, you know, I kind of gave myself the title. I wanted to be the champion for, for Citrix and, and our products. But as I've sort of, sit, sort of settled into my job, I joined the company back in August. I've found an interesting place in the company. I, I sit in the labs group, which is a highly distributed part of the company. My boss is in Sydney, Australia, and so are the majority of my coworkers and team that, wor that I work with. So the, the job is, is essentially what they would refer to as, in, as an intrapreneur. Basically, what, what I try to do is breathe new life into the company through the things you would do as an entrepreneur and try to portray that to the people within a, in the Citrix organization. So that breaks down into a few different things. One, I travel around and talk and meet with our customers and try to get a feel for what they're doing, what we would consider kind of empathy. You know, what are the things that you like about our products? What are the things you hate? And how can I sort of portray that to senior management in a way that we understand and can and help you in, in your daily job? So I try to sit alongside, you know, the end, the end user of our products, as well as the executives that might be buying the products. Two, I dream up sort of opportunities for us as a company. And this is something called the technology landscape, so which I'm co-authoring uh, within the labs. And that looks at trends in the industry that, that sort of look at the convergence of various technologies and how that might affect us as a business. It's pretty actually an exciting part of my job, basically pondering the future of tech, which I then share often on my blog on Forbes.com, which is focused on the same subject. And lastly, I get to take some of those ideas and actually build them. And I use a process which I call lean design thinking, which basically looks at sort of the opportunities broadly and then try to bring those down into a very specific overlapping idea of here are the things we're good at, here are the things I'm good at, and how can I implement that through an, an R&D effort within the company. And then we have a team of folks that basically I work with that build some of these crazy ideas. And these ideas are crazy. You know, we were talking about technology that's five or more years in the future. So it, it's not supposed to be incrementally better, it's supposed to be dramatically better. And that's essentially my job. It's, it's I believe, one of the best jobs in the company. But that's not what I'm here for today, specifically. Again, personal opinion type of stuff. One of the things that's interesting is in terms of my background. I was lucky enough to be among the early group of folks that dreamt up this idea of infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service back when we started doing it was in 2003. It was basically an, an itch to a, a need that we saw. One that said, I really hate scaling my applications on Linux-based systems. It was a real pain in the ass. So essentially what we did is simple. We took a Zen hypervisor, which was one of the only open source hypervisors at that time, and applied a web accessible API that we could manage the infrastructure via you know, a simple interface and adjust it based on demands that were placed on it. That was it. It was what I and gave it a fancy title because I love branding stuff. Elastic infrastructure provided as a service, which was then shortened to infrastructure as a service. Nobody got it at all in 2003. Everyone told me I was crazy, including my current employer, but they, they came around, don't worry. And the, the funny thing is, the, the, back then everyone thought, you know, you gotta take your 100 servers and boil them down to eight, that's the only use of virtualization. And I said, no, no, you gotta take your 100 servers and make them run as one and grow them, like, kind of like Moore's Law applied to a distributed amount of machines. 
And it took a while, but people started coming around to it. And over the years, the, this discussion has kind of continued. And the, the interesting part is where that is leading. So I created a diagram, because I like to sort of illustrate my thoughts in a visual way. And by the way, I'm going to make this available if anyone wants to play with it. If they don't agree with it, I'm going to put it on my Twitter account. You can download the source files and uh, use it. So this is the, the cloud universe as I see it. I, I've greatly simplified it. Obviously, there's a lot of different companies here that, are, that run the gamut. But these are, I would say, the main players in terms of the accesses of power and influence within the cloud world right now. Again, I'm greatly simplifying it. There's thousands of companies. But on one side of the spectrum, you have you know, us, which, which I would consider the pure play infrastructure as a service type offerings. Cloud, cloud Stack, obviously OpenStack, we have a lot of similarities. We, we are focused on very much similar things. Our, our accesses are very much aligned. On the other side, you have Cloud Foundry and OpenShift, and a few others, obviously. We also have pro, uh, projects here at the Apache Foundation, which would definitely fit within that realm. But in terms of sort of mind share, we haven't made it there. These, these are the things that I believe are the, the predominant mind share. And then we have hosted services that fit into both these ballparks. We've got AWS, which is that circle, should probably encompass most of this, but is, the circles aren't rep representative of the actual uh, amount of influence in the industry. They're just kind of placement in terms of where I see it. And then lately, funny enough, you have Windows and Microsoft. And that was an odd one because they started off a little bit slow, but they seem to be getting a lot of traction. And they started kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum from Amazon. Where Amazon started at the bottom, Microsoft started at the top. And so they're fundamentally taking sort of a different direction in terms of the convergence. And that's what this diagram is supposed to illustrate, is this idea of convergence versus divergence. I, and I, so the way I see it, a little animation here, things are coming together. So the school of thought is basically broken down into two ways to think about it. One, there's this belief that you need multiple platforms to do multiple things. You've got essentially the kind of cloud foundry approach that says, it's a unique platform that you can build your applications, and the infrastructure doesn't matter. That's all subtracted. All you need is this core set of APIs to build and deploy your apps. Again, simplified, simpl simplifying it to the bare basics here. It's, it's, a, it's a platform. It's for apps. It's for easy deployment. Who cares what happens underneath? And then the other end of the spectrum, we have this idea that you need all these infrastructure components that will essentially allow you to sort of build a legacy bridge. I need to take my applications from you know, the past and bring them into the cloud future. So here's the part of the equation that you know, I've been pondering. Because again, I've, I've been looking at this problem for, well, since 2003. And you know, that's, so that's 11 years at this point. And probably more than that, you know, if you take the sort of lead up to the initial versions of my own software about before I joined Citrix. And the, the rationale for the earliest versions of infrastructure as a service was simplicity. It was infrastructure was too difficult to use. And I wanted a way to simplify it down to, I just want it to work. But I also wanted my old applications to work, as well as my new. So I wanted this, again, this kind of bridge between the old and the new. I want to have the option to interact with those components, the in infrastructure, the network, the storage, all those things that I was used to. But I, I didn't want to necessarily have all of them if I didn't want them. So in this converged future, the question that I ask is, it's nice to have those things of the past, but do I want to run two independent environments, separate from one another? Or are we moving to a future where we are going to become less dependent on those components, more and more, less and less, whatever the word you want to use to describe that, to a point where it, it, it really doesn't matter? So taking a step back for a moment, if I'm going to build an app today, a mobile application, for example, I don't care at all about that stuff down below. All I care about is a set of APIs that I can work against and deploy and build and just magically works. Everything underneath is hidden and kind of abstracted to a point where it's kind of magical. Sorry, ma magic is probably the wrong word, but I'll get back to magic in a minute. So then you'll see DevOps. And, and I've got a love-hate relationship with DevOps. And, and from one point of view, I love the, the, the concepts of, of building and scripting and using programmatic means to build these systems. But I also believe that the purpose of, of an infrastructure provided as a service, or you know, even a platform, is that you don't have to worry about the ops part. All you need to focus on is the dev. You'll notice that I've kind of pushed DevOps down in my animation, because I, I believe that the dev part of, uh, is going to be important, but the ops 
will ultimately become less important as we move forward, which will probably tick off a few people who are in the DevOps space maybe, but that, that is my core belief. And if you guys don't, believe, don't think I'm on the right track, you know, speak up, I don't know. What do you Well, why don't you give us a, why don't you give us your uh, d description of what DevOps is? It's because it's more of a methodology than, or a way of thinking than it is any particular piece of software. So, so the idea is, it's great that the plumbing's taken care of with pass and infrastructure as a service. So that's great, um, and I agree with you there. But DevOps is going to move more into the application space because apps still have to get tested, apps still have to get built. Somebody has to run you know, Jenkins or the CI server, whatever you're using for that. And somebody has to be kind of, what DevOps is really about is increasing the flow of work of IT, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the lean principles that you kind of had already brought up and applying those principles to IT. And platform as a service and infrastructure as a service, I guess you could say leanifies to totally make up a word, that aspect of operations. Right, and so that it's a very easy consumable resource, but there's still so much in the value chain that has to get leanified to where you have this chain of like applications can just flow out very easily, and they're tested and you know they work, and that's where the DevOps space is going to go into as the plumbing gets taken care of and the plumbing becomes more ubiquitous. It's, in, I agree with you that it moves more into the developer space, but in your representation, the developer space moves into the apps. So, so I, I think fundamentally we're, we're, we're saying similar things, and whether or yes. not it sits at the bottom or the top is, is the question. I, I don't necessarily have an answer for that. <laughs> yeah, so I think it, it moves more into the apps and it gets out of the ass world. <laughs> the, the, that, that ass part was, yeah. was just uh, you know, was a fluke. I didn't really <laughs> put much thought into that. But I think, I think that, that the takeaway is, is dev is important and ops becomes less of a primary focus. Yeah, and I, and, but I... There's also this mythology of like, this shit just runs themselves, and we all know that that's not fucking true, right? Yeah, of course. Somebody is. still has to turn the dials of the pla past platforms and the infrastructure as a service platforms. We have a conference about cloud stack because somebody has to run the cloud stack cloud that everyone's consuming, right? Mm -hmm. So, ops is still there. Ops is still there. The there's a utopia that we're moving towards mm -hmm. where ops becomes maybe less of a headache and hassle. I, and I think that, that part of the issue is, is the sort of you know, legacy OS that we're forced to work within. Like, for example, user space. Who the hell needs that? And why, why, do, why, do, why is so much of our operating system reliant on something that's never actually used for the vast majority of applications that are being deployed, right? And that's the things that are breaking are typically being broken because of the people that are managing it. So my, my view, in a sense, is Anything we can do to remove people from the equation, and I'm not saying put people out of jobs. There'll always be jobs for people. But anything we can do to, to pick, take the human aspect of managing an infrastructure out of the equation is probably going to make the, the, the equation better and stronger and more scalable, ultimately. It's my, my view. It's always the network. So, yeah. Networks, all, it's always a DNS problem, right? Which relates to a guy that forgot to do some, something or other. Again, I'm going to make this... Um, this this available if you guys want it. I don't know. It looks cool. We all love graphics. So the future, which is what we're getting at, right? This this utopia. What does the future look like? You know, when 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 you go beyond the immediate future, I I, I agree that there's this uh, short term. The OS is not going away. The, we're stuck with the way things are in in a lot of ways. But then in the future, when we look at how the the internet becomes part, an integral part of the operating environment. What does that look like? And how do we get to that point? And that's part of this, this process that I'm trying to go through. I'm trying to say, okay, what is the, the utopia? What is that, that world that I want to build and work it within look like? And how, what do I need to build to make that happen? And that's a, that's a fundamental challenge that we have within this broader community. And I'm not saying just cloud stack. I'm saying open stack and infrastructure and platform as a service. We've, what we've done is we create this platform that says we can solve any problem for anyone without particularly focusing on any particular problem, right? So my, my short-term thinking here is the fact that I think that we need to look at this from more of a, what are we trying to accomplish? 
Like, what problem are we actually trying to do, would solve with, with this stuff? Are we trying to make our lives easier? Are we trying to remove the human aspect? Are we trying to make more money, maybe? Any, anybody have any thoughts? Like, what, what, is, the, what is the utopian future of, for, for this type of environment look like? Just random off the top of your head. Backend as a service, maybe? Mobile? Software as a service? The app rules? It's the app. I, I would agree. It's the app that matters. It's, it's, it's that thing that the end user experiences that matters. It's not that muck at the bottom. Yes. Some, somewhere someone has to work in the boiler room, right? If Scotty on, on Star Trek, you know, I need more power or whatever. There's always going to be a person there. It's just the, I think the nature of their job is going to change. The future looks good, though. And that's, that's the thing. We're, we're in a tumultuous time. Things are changing. And that's where the opportunity lies and the fact that there is so much change in, in this industry. So I started from the bottom. But are we, are we here yet? It's, I got to... That's a rap reference, sorry, so if you don't get, if you don't get it. He's, he's one of the biggest rappers in Canada, apparently. But, uh, and, and it's a great animation. But the, the, the fundamental question is, you know, where, where are we going, and, and why is that guy dancing like that? But, you know, it's, it, it's, it's going to be an interesting part, and I think that as we move up the stack, determining those success metrics and what actually means success in our industry and in our, our project, as some mechanism to define, you know, what, what, are, what are we doing and how we know when we get there and we're successful? Is that a, an active community? Is that a set of tools? Is that some, some a-hole dancing in front of a Bentley? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same story over and over, right? We're, we're trying to do these things without having a clear picture of where and what we're moving towards. And that's, that's the challenge here. And one of the reasons I came to this conference this week is to get that answer. Like, what are, we, what are we building towards? What are we doing? What, what do we envision the future of this to look like? I don't know if I have an answer to that just yet. But I know it doesn't look like this. And that's what it feels like, right? It feels like we're just kind of blasting through without this clear direction of what and how we want to get to that point. I can't imagine being on that bus, by the way. <laughs> you know, it's, recently I had an opportunity to take this course at Stanford, thank you Citrix, by the way, for, that was focused on design thinking. And again, what, the big part of this design thinking process is the fact that you want to kind of empathize with that end user and put yourself into the experience of what that end user is going through. So maybe, maybe we could do more of that. Maybe we could focus on what the end user is experienced when using not only our software, but everybody's software, other people's software, what, you know, and how, how we're helping them. Possibly. I don't want to be on that bus, though, I'll tell you that. Is it magic? Or is it focus? Is it broad? We can do anything for everyone and magically solve everyone's problems? Or, is it, or do we focus on the specific problems that we're solving for those users? What's that? It's always magic. It's always magic. It, well, yeah, and if, if, if we're doing it right, it probably looks like magic, but we're... Exactly. It's a cool graphic, too, you know? Okay. I want to be the guy with the fire, though, I think. I, my belief is it's focus. And again, I would more specifically relay that to verticalization. You know, it's, it's choosing the right vertical. It's, it's about understanding that particular problem set that we're trying to solve for that one particular vertical. And my belief here, again, one guy's opinion, if we can figure out what that vertical is and be a dominant player in that, then the other verticals will follow suit. It's an existential question, I suppose. And it comes down to you'll know it when you see it. So th this kind of brings me to back to, this, to the kind of OpenStack discussion. You know, what, why does OpenStack have the sort of mind share in the industry? Their software isn't as good as ours, which is arguable, I suppose. But in many ways, in our feature set, we're, we're, we're just as good, if not better. 
the, the key difference in terms of our community versus theirs is one of perception, right? They've got a, la a laundry list of logos that they've collected and as much politics in, in, as well in, in that particular mix of logos. It's a, it's a perception thing, right? It's the fact that they have this sort of unknown sort of substance, right, that, that makes you feel like you want to be part of that group. How do we get that? How do we go and say, I want that thing, whatever it is? Is it money? Is that, you think that's the key difference? They, they, they've got more funding? Because if that was the case, how do you get companies like Docker? They take 10-year-old technology, slap some magic on top of it, and suddenly you're next biggest thing? You know, it's, I don't think money is necessarily the, the answer. Maybe. Mark, what do you think? Well, I, the, the, the Docker sort of, if you guys are familiar, the, this kind of the latest hotness within the open source space, you've probably all heard of it if you're in this room, but they, they've gone from essentially nowhere in, a, in about a year to the hottest thing going. And by taking, you know, Linux containers, commonly available, we, we all have it, we support it, and slapping some DevOps magic on top of it, you, you know, fundamentally, the, the technology isn't radical, it isn't even actually all that new, yet they've managed to, to get the sort of hearts and minds of the open source community in no time at all. Why wasn't that us? Maybe. You think, you think there's a lesson, you know, we, we could sort of, you know, dissect their recent success and say, hey, what are some of those, if it's just timing, then I don't think we can do anything. Is there more that we could dissect from that? Good marketing, I, I would, yeah. I love graphics, I love marketing, I would agree there. Marketing is a key. It's, maybe marketing is a spark. Un underneath, it's, it's the people. So the engineer is going to say, okay, what's my future? My future is I need to know something that everybody has hype about. Mm -hmm. So his thought is, what's the hype? It's that. So he's going to go ahead and he's going to say, I need that because when I look for my next job, this is what the, everybody's going to look for and this is what's hot and whether it works or not is irrelevant. It's, it's what everybody thinks. You know, partially they're being selfish. Partially they don't know any better. I, I actually, and, and hype helps it. Hype. I actually hang, hung out with some of the uh, OpenStack folks uh, earlier this week, and they, they, off the record, they freely admitted that the technology wasn't there yet, and that wasn't their key value proposition. Which, yeah. And that, that brings us back to Mark's point. Then is, is that money? Or can you build hype in, from other sources? A lot of reason Docker. Thanks. A lot of the reason that Docker became successful so quickly is it's easy to use, right? I mean, you download it, you you get going with it. For um, those end developers who are um, really giving it a lot of attention and talk, it's they see something they're like, wow, it is closer to magic because for them it just works. Whereas if you look at something like uh, um, the other cloud, 
that's just pure hype, right? I mean, it's, you don't see anyone saying, wow, I got OpenStack up and running in half an hour. So it's, it, I think it varies from one thing to another, but whatever it is, there's some way that people feel um, compelled to talk about it, uh, either because of something is being so incredible or they want to be part of a larger story. Yes. And that seems to snowball if you do it right. It's, it's, it's definitely an interesting point. Maybe there's an opportunity for us to, to cozy up with that. Maybe there's an overlapping intersection of, of what we do with what they do. Could be, could be something to explore. Then there's this idea of this kind of rapid elasticity, which brings me back to Paz. I got way off topic there, which, which is part of what I do. I, it's, it's this brain process I go through. And you know, back to the, the, the platform as a, as a, ser, as a service uh, question. Rapid elasticity is important, right? We're building, there's hybrid future, what's a little bit of mine, a little bit of yours, this ability to scale it quickly and easily. Maybe that's part of the opportunity going forward, addressing the sort of intersection of that what's mine and what's yours component. And I think we've done a, we've done a great job in terms of laying that initial found, you know, foundation. And that's where I'm bringing back to the sort of platform as a service and this whole idea of convergence of the two. I think that Building an application is, is hard. Deploying it, scaling it, all those things. And our job is essentially to make it easy. I think in the, in the, in the simplest terms, that, that's why we exist. Our, our, we exist fundamentally to make that job easier. I'm not saying anything about people at all, the muck at the bottom, but essentially, if you look at it, you're gonna deploy on a cloud because it's easier than deploying on a single server or, or even a, a couple servers. So back to the platform as a service you know, future. I, d I don't believe that we should have these two se separate systems. I think going forward, uh, probably the big part of what we're gonna do is to create an experience for our users that makes that process of deploying, deployment of the application, whether it's here, there, or somewhere else, as easy as possible. And ultimately, that will be the, the opportunity, I think, for us in our platform in terms of driving that future. Chip, you've been pretty quiet back there. What are you, what are you, what are you thinking? You agree with me? I, I invite you here to, to argue with me. <laughs> we, all, we all agree with each other. Oh, Samir's here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put him on the spot. How, how's it going? So, so, so in, case, in case you don't know Samir, Samir is uh, our, our GM. He runs our cloud platform uh, group. And we've been, we've been discussing our, our platform future and the, the, the two fundamental aspects of convergence versus divergence. My belief, convergence. Things are coming together. What are, what are, your, what are your thoughts? On the, on the spot, he's gonna kill me for this later. No, it's all good. Convergence, I assume, of PaaS and IAS, or divergence of PaaS and yes, IAS? Yes, Oh, no question, convergence, yeah. I don't think there's any question. I mean, you just look at what Amazon uh, Web Services has done as the easiest model, or, you know, whatever, X billion and running. And it's awfully difficult to discern where their IAS stops and where their PaaS capabilities yeah. start, right? And that's, uh, I think, the easiest and clearest example or proof of that convergence. And I think we'll continue to see that in, uh, in the landscape of people that are trying to help other customers build solutions that look like that. Does that, do you think that means building things that looks more like, I don't know, Cloud Foundry? Is that, what does that translate into to actual features and functionality? I'm putting you on the spot, man. <laughs> you, you came in, I, that's, that's how I roll. <laughs> uh, no, it's a good question. Obviously, we have a, um, uh, a great ecosystem of partners that provide PaaS capabilities on top of what we do um, at the CloudStack layer as a, as a community. Um, do I think that they will get subsumed into, will they become a solution I think there's no question they'll become a solution. The question is whether they become a technology, because that you know, obviously has lots of other implications, but I don't think there's any doubt that we'll be, you know, two years from now, I expect us to be selling that solution, not a infrastructure as a service solution. We will be talking about applications to customers a lot more than infrastructure in a couple of years. It, well, by the way, a couple of years, Starting today on yeah. a gradual basis is a question of like when is it mainstream to when are you dealing with the early adopters? I think most of the early adopter conversations even now, I can't think of a cloud platform deal that we have done recently 
where we weren't talking to them about how they were deploying their applications uh, on top of the platform. What tools they were going to use, whether they were config management tools or what PaaS partners they were going to use. Most of the RFPs that we're responding to are typically including both layers of the stack. So customers are already looking for both sets of capabilities. Um, but you're right, I don't, I don't really see a great answer in the market for a single technology stack. There are great components at each of the layers, and they're all coming together and converging in the sense that they're getting better integrated. But I haven't, I'm, there's not a single integrated stack yet anywhere. Yeah, and if, if we could predict the future, we'd all be billionaires anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm running low on time here, so what we're going to probably have to do is we're going to have to transition this, this conversation over to Chip's uh, follow-up on the, the subject. Again, my, my, my job, I think, is to try to help think differently about what we're doing. You know, ask those questions and ponder the, the futures. You know, if, if I helped a little bit, I, I hope I did, you know, let's, let's see where it goes. I really enjoy being part of this community. And I think going forward, I, I'm going to do what I can to help grow this community. Um, that's a big part of what I think I, I add in terms of my value here. So for example, um, coming up in Budapest, the next, next location, I've uh, volunteered to help organize. So hopefully that helps if it does. And I'm, I'm available on, on Twitter, Roof. I, I blog. If you want to ping me, have questions about how Citrix works, I'm happy to help. Think of me as your kind of liaison between the outside and the inside. That's what I'm here to do. Thanks again for listening to my ramblings. I appreciate it.